My toes gingerly crept to the edge of my comfort, the pockets and rivets in the cement stinging the bottoms of my bare feet, urging me to leap. But my heart sunk into the abyss of what seemed inevitable. The fear swirled effortlessly in reflective rings amidst the turmoil in my head. I couldn't fathom jumping. I recoiled at the thought of the sensation on my skin, chilled and raising baby hairs on the back of my neck. It was an inch and three seconds away, I said. It would be over, I said. But she told me to think differently. You'll hurt your head, she said, failing to consider the pain the extra small Rapunzel swim cap had on my extra large head. My electric blue Cookie Monster swimsuit with frills on each side, desperately clinging onto my toddler chub. Smudges of jelly and youthful bliss around the corners of my mouth. You'll make a fool of yourself, she said, neglecting the fact that by awkwardly lingering by the ledge, I was looking foolish enough. You'll fall on someone, immersed in the glowing blue beneath you, she said. You'll hit the bottom. You know you can't do it. She gave me harsh warnings to fear what was below me, so naturally, I clenched my eyes contemplating. The water's mysterious flow could not be trusted. It's mysterious flow would trap me in a violent maelstrom, and I would sink to the floor and be forgotten. As thoughts zoomed through my head past the speed limit, goosebumps crawled up my arms like a spider vigilantly crafting its web. I envisioned being submerged in the surreal, silent atmosphere, controlled with chlorine and surrounded by bubbles frantically reaching the surface as if in a race. Serene and still, Maybe it's peaceful down there, I said. But she entered the discussion fashionably late as usual and told me my lungs would soon crave their taste for air, that the deep end was the realm of the local ocean that nobody should dare enter, that the gutter would swallow me up whole, along with forgotten pool noodles, floaties, and memories. So I ran, away from the pool, away from the edge, she smiled. She locked the door shut to opportunity with my consent. It was as if I was powerless. Three years old, she was my barrier. This was the first time that I had confronted a barrier. I was three years old, chubby and conflicted, at the very edge of the pool, whether to jump or not. And as the overly visual toddler I was, and still am today, I visualized her as a tall, slender figure, caving over my thoughts, and my judgment caving in as well, and my peripheral vision cut off. She then became copy-pasted into every difficult situation I faced. I didn't know how to get rid of her, and she followed me. But recently, I came to the conclusion that there's a very simple process to overcoming mental barriers. So today, after a dramatic recollection of my first confrontation with a barrier, I'm here to tell you that the entirety of overcoming one is the process of defining and defying it. This seems like a difficult task at hand, but truly, it's all up to you. To define your barriers, you have to create a personal scan of your brain. And I'm not talking anatomically correct. I'm talking about a visual interpretation of the way you believe you retain and create information. If you're having trouble, because it's kind of a crazy thing to think about, start with what I like to call the hotel model. After all, your brain is the hospitality of your thought. Like a hotel, the brain has an electrical powerhouse, a way that it provides energy for your brain to do day-to-day -day things. Your powerhouse contains of three basic outlets. Your intellectual outlet, your social outlet, and my personal favorite, your passion outlet. 
The intellectual outlet is different and looks different for people of different ages. For babies, the intellectual outlet is utilized for their development of the perception of this beautiful thing we call Earth. For children, starting in kindergarten, all the way through college, it's an academic outlet. This is used for going to school every day and doing that wonderful thing we love to call homework. And for adults, the intellectual outlet is utilized for vocational purposes, whatever analytics may come their way. Maybe it's mortgages, bills, something called a 401k, and other adult things I'm still not really sure about. The next outlet is your social outlet. And like a person, the social outlet will present itself differently based off of the relevance of the social life on your everyday life. Your social outlet should include your friends, your family, your dog, your uncle, whoever it may be. And as weird as it sounds, yourself. Because every person needs to be self-aware of their presence in their social life. The last outlet, my favorite outlet, is the passion outlet. This allows you to utilize power to feel comfort in your own skin. It gives you the ability to de-stress from the crazy, crazy life that we all live. It's different for everyone, and it can consist of many different things that you find comfort in. For example, if you find your passion waiting on the sidelines of a court or a field, and you're an athlete, then your passion outlet is entirely athletic. I'm not exactly what you would call the athlete. I proved that on my way here by tripping on a non-existent crack. But if this is where your passion lies, that is a part of your passion outlet. My outlet includes creative expression. I love all forms of art, music, poetry, and writing. Once you've been able to fully establish your three outlets in your brain, you can understand their connection to each other and the barriers that may lay within them. If you have to plug into more than one, bar more than one outlet at once, it can cause stress. At school, for example, students have to plug into their academic outlet, their social outlet, and for extracurriculars, their passion outlet. I don't even have enough hands to show you how stressful that is on the human brain. And it's very hard for people to fully understand how to cope with this stress, leading to a barrier that you can define. So now that you've established the three outlets of your brain, you can take the train of thought to get to your lobby. My lobby looks something like this. It's what I like to call my beautiful mess. Maybe yours is a spreadsheet, or not. Maybe it's a heaping pile of information, or not. Maybe it's color-coded to perfection. Mine is organized in relevance, and sometimes it's not even organized at all. By doing this, I've been able to analyze my brain to its fullest extent and see where my barriers may lie. Now that I've realized my connection to my ground level and my lobby, I've been able to define the barriers in my mind, making it a lot easier to defy them. It really sets the roadmap for the next process. Once you have defined your barriers, to defy them is a whole separate task. You must analyze situations deeper. Take the cognitive decision to be able to look into the same situation through a different perspective, or maybe looking at a, lo at a location slightly differently than you had come at it at first. And I'm not saying to overthink, because there's a very fine line between overthinking and analyzing appropriately. That's commonly mistaken. Trust me, I've definitely done this many times. But once you've been able to fully analyze a situation to its fullest, you can finally come to the conclusion that you will be able to defy this barrier. Looking back at the pool, for example, if I could have analyzed the situation deeper, maybe even for a few more seconds, by a mere gaze at the lifeguard to my left, or the swim instructor with warm, open arms ready to catch me, and my parents cheering me on at the benches, I would leap into the air for what felt like eternity until a foreign jolt of icy chill would surround me. It would be uncomfortable, sure, and I'm certain there would be many tears involved. But it wouldn't be new anymore, and I could take pride in it 
and tell all my friends at the playground next, the next day that I, Yael Bright, jumped into that pool with two confident feet. But realistically, I hadn't jumped into that pool until I was seven. Pool parties, regardless of the occasion, were an automatic RSVP no until 2010. Yikes. Flash forward. It's 2019. I'm 16 years old and I'm still figuring it out. There are so many things about this earth that I've yet to understand and who knows if I ever will, like a 401k. But I've come to the conclusion that I stand wholeheartedly by the process of defining and defying your barriers. By analyzing your mind to its fullest extent, you can see where the strengths and the weaknesses fall and the way that they are connected to each other. And by analyzing a situation to its fullest extent, you can see the perspective of another person and find beauty. And now that you've been able to develop this skill, life will change. There's going to be a new outlook considering the beauty around you that maybe you had never seen before. I mean, I'm 16 years old and this isn't exactly my forte, but Today, I defined and defied the barrier of confrontation and social anxiety just to truly emphasize to you the power you can utilize by adapting this method and understanding your brain on an individual interpretation. This will make everything so much more clearer, I assure to you. I've come to the conclusion once again that life, unfortunately, is not a pool party if only. But maybe it is, in a sense. So now I propose to you to jump into the pool with two confident feet and define and defy all the barriers that may come your way. I wish you the best of luck. Thank you.